this segment, we're going to review some principles of effective design. These are worth knowing if you are designing an instruction sheet or perhaps an in-service presentation for your colleagues. You may even develop patient education materials, public health campaigns, or even a website, along with, of course, scientific papers. There are some elements that make your designs more appealing as well as more effective. We begin with Robin Williams on the Joshua Tree Epiphany. Robin Williams, the author of the Non-Designer's Design Book, recalls a tree identification book she once received for Christmas from her parents. The first tree in the book was the Joshua Tree because it only required two clues to identify. Williams recalls saying to herself, oh, we don't have that kind of tree in Northern California. That is a weird looking tree. I would know if I saw that tree and I've never seen one before. Imagine her surprise, her epiphany, when she went outdoors with book in hand and discovered that nearly all of the homes in her neighborhood had Joshua trees in the front yard. We often don't notice certain aspects of our surroundings or environment unless someone or something calls our attention to it. This can be extended to document design and visuals. We tend to notice when a document looks more professional and when it doesn't but we may not be able to explain to ourselves exactly why that is. It's actually not that difficult to learn the techniques to improving the visual appeal of your documents. In fact, Robin Williams developed an acronym to help people remember the elements of effective page design. C for contrast, R for repetition, A for alignment, P for proximity. Well, you must admit it is memorable. Together, these criteria give us cues for how to read a graphic and give you, the medical writer, some cues on whether your design is really effective or not. We'll look at each of these in turn in a moment, but first, let's look at some general principles of effective design. Good design helps you achieve your communications objectives in that it helps your readers understand and locate information. It also helps them notice highly important content. For example, if you were to open your textbook, Writing in the Sciences, right now, and turn to the table of contents, you'll notice it achieves these objectives. The readers can understand the information. They can see the book's contents are divided into parts, then chapters, and then sections within the chapters. Highly important content stands out in bold type, then you can see on which page you can locate the information. Good design also helps you achieve your communication's persuasive objectives. Sometimes the most difficult part is persuading readers to read what you've written in the first place. A good design can help you achieve that goal because it encourages readers to feel good about the communication itself as well as its subject matter. Think about a particular website you like to visit. Why do you like it? It's probably because it's well designed, it has a professional look and seems well put together. The visuals align with the text very well, you can find information you're looking for very easily, and it's simple to navigate. You feel good not only about visiting the site, but also perhaps about the subject matter it contains. Now we'll look at each criterion of good design, beginning with contrast. As the word implies, it makes different aspects of the communication stand out, so you can use contrast to emphasize certain points. Look again at the table of contents in your textbook. Dominant elements are in darker type and a larger font. Lesser elements are in standard type rather than bold, and in your textbook the lesser elements are even in a different font. This creates dynamism. You feel as if there's some energy or purpose behind the text. That is achieved in this instance through contrast. Here we have repetition. Again, look at your textbook. What do you see? You see that the page numbers are always located in the same position throughout the book. The chapter number and title are located on the left page and the section title is on the right page. The visuals are set off by dark bars above and below. The point of all this is to create consistency and a feeling of unity by repeating the same design throughout the book. This is true of page design in any setting. 
for example. Here we see two flyers from the same corporation. You'll see that certain design elements repeat on both flyers. The same purple box contains the event title and the day and time are listed in the same place above it. This indicates the type of announcement to employees so they know at a glance that the flyer is providing information about a meeting. So we have repeated design and consistency and this creates unity. Here is an example of creating repetition using a text page. Repetition unifies your communication visually. For instance, here you'll notice that the page numbers are always going to be in the same place and in the same typeface. There's always going to be a double rule at the top of the page and a single one at the bottom, and headings and subheadings are shown in a consistent typeface. This document will be more than one page, so we'll see that same design repeated throughout the document. Alignment is a way to create visual flow and visually connect elements. In the pie chart shown here, you can see one piece, the green one, is slightly separated from the others. We can surmise that the writer will want to draw certain emphasis to whatever it is that this particular piece represents. To create alignment, we want to place text and the images accompanying it along the same grid line. So if you're writing instructions, the direction and the accompanying graphic should be aligned horizontally or vertically so the reader can easily see which step goes with which picture. As you can see here, I have an example of how to harness a dog. Step one is right underneath the first picture. Step two shows how to get the harness over the head. Step three is tightening the strap and steps four and five show how to fasten the buckles. So each step's text goes with each step's graphic or picture. Proximity groups related elements and separates unrelated elements, or at least it's supposed to. Here we have two flyers. Both contain the same information, but you can see how much more difficult it is to read and make sense of the flyer on the left. None of the information is arranged in a way that makes sense to the reader. You can convey words, but if your reader can't understand your point, you're not communicating. The flyer on the right clearly shows what is happening when and where. The different types of dance are grouped into categories, and additional information is shown at the bottom. We have all four elements, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity working together. Creating proximity. There's a two-pronged approach to doing so because we have to create proximity with pictures as well as with words. So here, we want to place more closely related items closer together while separating less closely related items. The medical supplies are organized so they are closer together, whereas the three scientists are engaged in three separate activities so they are placed further apart. Now, let's move to what you should look for when selecting visuals to accompany your text. The process is similar to choosing words you need to consider the purpose and the audience. You also need to think about who your readers are and what you want them to get out of it. So visuals must serve these same purposes. Readers tend to notice the visual elements of a document first, so it is important to think about how your message is conveyed through visuals. That is, do they convey information in a way that your readers will understand? Will they reach the same conclusion or have the same reaction you want them to have? Whenever you're choosing visuals, you need to carefully consider global audiences. Why? Because you wouldn't want to inadvertently offend your readers by using a graphic they might find offensive or at least confusing. Here we have two gestures. In North America, they are meant to convey goodwill or at least something positive, but in other parts of the world, they are considered vulgar and offensive. When you think about global audiences, you make translation easier, avoid embarrassing yourself or your company, and earn respect for your organization and its products or services. Again, 
you want to use visuals that will increase your communication's usability and persuasiveness. Even if you're only persuading them to read it in the first place, a well-designed document gets you halfway there. You'll need to think about what visuals will be most appropriate and useful for your readers. For instance, if you are writing a set of instructions using a piece of equipment, you should include a visual which shows the reader what he or she would expect to see if everything is working according to plan. Not all visuals convey points effectively by themselves. You need to introduce visuals in the accompanying text. When appropriate, you'll also need to tell your readers what information the visual is meant to convey and what conclusions they are expected to reach. For example, this information is arranged in a table so that the reader can quickly and easily compare and contrast different options. You would use tables to help readers find and use data, facts, or advice. Here, the line graph illustrates different scenarios. The reader can understand the relationships among variables more quickly and easily than from written paragraphs. Bar graphs can be used to help readers compare quantities. Line graphs serve a similar function, so you may need to consider which type of graph would be the most effective. In this instance, the bar graph shows a clear contrast between an average and those which fall above or below it. Having the same data in a line graph will be difficult to read because of the number of variables. Pie charts can also help readers compare quantities. For instance, here we have pie charts showing a budget for a family requiring health care in different areas. Each chart shows how much money should be allocated for each expense. If you're trying to educate someone about medical technology, it may be helpful to use a schematic or a drawing like this. Readers can get a better sense of how to operate machinery if they understand how it is assembled and how it works. You can also use charts to help readers understand a process or a procedure. For instance, here, an intake person is trying to decide whether an adult patient can consent to treatment and can use this chart to help make that determination. A timeline can help readers visualize a series of steps in a process and find out when a certain step will take place, as well as what needs to be completed before that particular step can happen. Sometimes photographs are very effective in helping readers understand what a situation looks like. Here we have a radiograph showing a cancerous tumor in the lung. As with any other type of visual, it's important to be aware of ethical considerations. You want to be sure that you are using graphs, visuals, and photos in a way that is understandable and not misleading to readers. We'll turn now to considering how to incorporate visual and text design in a document. We have six elements to think about when designing a text page. Text, obviously. Headings and subtitles. Graphics, white space, headers and footers, and other physical features such as contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. How do you plan a design? You begin by thinking about your readers. Who are your readers? What do you want them to get out of this? How do you want to influence them? Essentially, you'll ask yourself the same 10 questions I mentioned in Module 1. Create a visual framework for your page design. Your major goals are simplicity, consistency, attractiveness, and meaningfulness. So your text page will contain text, graphics, headings, and other visual elements. You can see on this that this text page consists of two columns and words, so the layout is visually attractive. If we were to look at different issues of the same publication, we would find a consistent design, so it would be easy to find whatever information we sought. 
When we're designing pages, we want to use contrast to create a visual hierarchy. That is, we want to be certain that some elements stand out to help the readers focus on the important details. Here, we see contrast in terms of typeface, color, and size. We have similar elements close to each other. For instance, the list of specialties is located on the left side, so readers can easily select what they want to read. If you were to look at subsequent pages, you would see the same basic design repeated throughout the website. There is also good use of white space, and the columns are nicely aligned to make the page look attractive and easy to navigate. Align Related Visual Elements. This is an instruction sheet on using a defibrillator. Again, the instruction and the accompanying visual are in close proximity to one another, so the instructions are easy to follow. Again, think about the visual framework and how to best present your information within it. Here, again, we have all the elements coming together. There's a single and double rule on each page, the page numbers are in the same place, and we have the same typeface for headings and subheadings. The text is aligned, and we have contrast in that the headings stand out. White space is used to denote proximity. Just as you would with Word, with visuals, it's important to consider what visual impact your words have. You will want to choose a font or a typeface which is easy for your readers to read. As you may have discovered in this point in your medical or scientific career, scientists have a great deal of information to read as well as write, so why not make it easier on the eyes? Use a typeface that has strong, distinct main lines. There are times when you want to create emphasis, such as a keyword or concept, but try to avoid using bold type or italics too often because they then become less effective. In many of your textbooks, you'll notice that keywords or terms are either italicized or written in bold, but if too much text is formatted that way, it becomes harder to figure out what's really important. Underlining used to be used for emphasis. These days, it would be too easily confused with hyperlinks, and your readers may be trying to click on something that's not, in fact, going to take them anywhere so you're better off using another means of creating emphasis instead. And as you're writing an acronym or an abbreviation, avoid using all capital letters. It creates an unprofessional look, is more difficult to read, and appears that you are shouting, especially to those of us who use the internet long before formatting tools were available for email, and could be considered offensive. If you're not old enough to remember that, be grateful. To sum up practical page design, you want to plan the amount of text and graphics you'll include on each page, and this will depend on the size and shape of the final document along with binding. Are you printing a poster? A booklet? Will it be spiral bound or three hole punched? All of these can affect what you place on a page and where. It may be helpful to draw a thumbnail sketch using different grid patterns. Make a full-size mock-up of your design once you've planned it out. This is especially important if you're collaborating with others as a team. Having a style sheet establishes clear guidelines for everyone, such as what font you're going to use, what page margins, where a caption should be placed near the visuals, etc. It keeps the visual framework consistent from one writer to the next, thus reducing editing time. Test your final results. As always, you will proofread, proofread, and proofread again. It will also be helpful to have a colleague who has not been involved with the project review it for content as well as style. Let's review a few points to remember. Do not use a visual just to be able to say you have a visual. It needs to have a purpose so that it helps the reader understand exactly what it is you are trying to communicate, and it should be well explained in the accompanying text. This visual illustrates child abuse and neglect trends over 20 years. The information is provided more clearly and concisely than it would be in a written paragraph, but that written paragraph needs to explain how this data were gathered. 
So really, this is essentially what you want design to do. You want to help readers understand information, you want to help them locate information, recognize highly important content, and achieve your communications objectives. You should also take care to set up a visual design that will be helpful rather than confusing. This visual, believe it or not, is meant to help parents to decide what in medication to give a child who reports having a headache. In the end, all it's going to do is give the parent a headache as well. There are circles of different colors and sizes, but it's nearly impossible to understand exactly what whoever did this had in mind. A table with symptoms next to the appropriate medication would have been much easier to understand. This visual is also very overcrowded. As with words, sometimes less is more. Don't crowd too much information onto a graphic or a single page because the reader probably isn't going to take time to make sense of it. People have gotten away from using clip art and cartoon art in recent years, and that's probably a good thing. Too much clip art suggests a lack of substance in your communication. For instance, if you type medical writing into an image search engine, you'll get clip art like this in the results. Do they really reinforce the message you're trying to convey, or do they simply look as if you included visuals because you could? Your textbook provides some helpful information. If you're interested in further reading, you can follow these links for more tips on good design and presenting information effectively. Thank you. Namaste. And good luck.